everyone. We're very excited to be here for the fifth session of the Learning Salon. Do you guys see me? Just making sure, looking at the chat. It'll take a minute for you guys to be able to see us, I guess. If you see us, please say something in the chat. There is a delay, maybe. Yes, okay. Glad that people can see us. All right, great. People can see us. Hi, Harrison. Hi, Tara. Hi, Shai Shakufe. Thank you for being here. All right, guys. Um, we are more than 75% through the year, uh, if you believe it or not. Uh, but the, the year has had twists all along the way. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to uh, uh, say, okay, this is our fifth session, meaning that we've been doing this for a little over a month now. And I'm very grateful. And I, I had a feeling of gratitude for the community that we have been creating with the help of Jovo and with the help of John Krakauer and all of you who attend, as well as the help of Kanaka and Claire and Eva and Brad, who have helped us in the chat. Uh, the Learning Salon is hosted by myself. I'm Aida Momenejad. I'm a senior researcher in reinforcement learning. I do human reinforcement learning. Uh, and Jovo, who's Joshua Vogelstein, he's a professor of biomedical engineering at Hopkins. And John Krakauer, who probably everyone in the world knows, he is also a professor at Johns Hopkins and um, has uh, actually uh, been a wonderful sort of bringer together of people uh, in our salon. And after this uh, sort of brief introduction, John will uh, give a recap of what has ha happened in the past four weeks and how it connects to our first philosophy session uh, with our wonderful guest, Marcin Milkowski. So um, just a reminder, I want everyone to be as respectful as they can. Uh, as uh, John once said, this is not about the cult of the cleverest person in the room. We are here to discuss things with each other and engage with each other's thoughts. I'm very happy to say that in the past week, which has been difficult with the debates and the news, et cetera, um, our community has collectively engaged in above 3,000 tweets following last week's talk. So we are very happy that we care about each other's talks. We care about each other's thoughts and about each other's research so much. I want to give a shout out to Neuromatch and to Conrad Cording and um, other folks at Neuromatch. Uh, they have extended the deadline, as far as I understand, to the 7th. Uh, they asked us to give a shout out to them and remind everyone to submit your work. All works that want to uh, be presented as, as a talk will be accepted at Neuromatch. So it's not a bad opportunity to keep continuing the sort of online tradition of keeping the neuroscience community together. And with that, I just want to remind you to use the Ask a Question button to ask your questions and vote on each other's questions in the chat during the talks or during people's uh, sort of uh, PowerPoint presentation. Please only just uh, have clarification questions and Kanaka and Brad are going to help you there. And yeah, uh, I hope that this is going to be as fun or even more fun than every other week. And with that, I just um, open up the stage to John. Thank you, Ida. Um, so yes, it, it's hard to believe that it's already the fifth one, um, and I'm still trying to recreate the steps by which Josh and Ida managed to get me here in this salon, but it just feels like there was no time when we weren't doing this. Um, I wanted to sort of just reiterate one thing, is I think we saw the absolute worst way to engage in a debate, right? Um, two elderly white men, one in particular, shouting at each other, right? With no one being able to get a word in edgewise, right? Um, we would like to think, and I'm echoing Ida always, um, that we can do something the other end of the spectrum, right? Where everyone can get involved and we redress this balance that we still weighted down with, with respect to our leaders here in the US. Um, so I would very much like people not to be afraid of coming into the room, you know, no matter what 
you know, your background or what stage of your education. We promise you that this is about everyone feeling welcome. Um, and so we'd like that to be the big success of this salon is that new voices uh, are heard, okay? Um, and I think we're getting better at that. Um, what have we done so far? So the first um, session was with Conrad and uh, I think we, you know, invited Conrad for two reasons. One, because he was interested in the topic and wrote his microprocessor paper and because he'd really set the ball rolling for these big online neuroscience sessions. And I think the takeaway from Conrad, um, other than he hated tuning, which he said about a hundred times, um, was that maybe we have an easier time learning how the brain works rather than how the brain works, right? So we can look at the learning rather than the end process. Then we had Adrian Fellhall on, a uh, professor of neuroscience, who really was wonderfully ecumenical. I mean, she showed us all the way from the biophysics of neurons to connectome to cell types to computational theories that she thought that there would be a way to wed the sort of functionalist view with the implementational view um, in some harmonious way. Um, Melanie Mitchell, who was professor of computer science, really came on to say that there's this barrier that um, still has not been uh, breached by current AI, which is the barrier of meaning, uh, which I think gets a little bit into what Marcin will talk about. You know, in other words, she was making this appeal to what are we going to do about semantics? Um, and then Tony Zader came on, um, who sort of took the other end of the spectrum, thinking that there's a much bigger distance um, between AI and a mouse than there is between a mouse and meaning. And so if we solve the mouse, we'll get to meaning just by looking at the neurophysiology and the incremental changes that evolution has brought us, but that AI was really kind of barking up the wrong tree by trying to think about, and this is what he said, so I don't want to be jumped on, that we just need to learn against a fairly generic network architecture and just get the algorithms right and we'll get there. And he was against that. Um, now, Marcin Milkowski from Poland, who's a philosopher of mind, and I actually have known about him for quite a while because I read his book explaining the computational mind, which I think is a really good book, I recommend it, um, uh, is now going to enter the fray and tell us why should we think that the brain is not a computer? In other words, I believe he starts his book by talking about the um, four weddings and a funeral style that uh, is the computational theory of mind on the rocks. In other words, will dynamicists in bodyists, in activists, connectivists, neural network AI people finally put the nails in the coffin of the, I call it, forgive me, Marcin, the neo Fordorian view that we still can talk about cognition as uh, computation over representations. And is that view on its last legs, or are you going to revive it in some new form? Uh, forgive me if that is an unfair characterization of, of, of your argument. Um, so that's where we stand. Um, let's hope that there'll be 50, not five of these, and uh, let's get going. So uh, Marcin, uh, I hand over to you. Okay. Thanks for the invitation. It's exciting to, to, to be here and to have the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, you as the first philosopher uh, who has, has had the opportunity, or probably will have the opportunity to talk to you. So uh, let me just put my slides on uh, because my face might not, might not be the most interesting thing to see uh, given that it's 10 p.m. today in Warsaw. So basically, uh, I'm trying, oh, is it, okay. So my message is uh, basically uh, somewhat, uh, if you think it's Neo-Fedorian, I think it might be in, an interesting take on what I'm saying because on one hand, I would be saying that yes, uh, there, is, there is something interesting about computations of a representation, but I will be trying to have 
a slightly different view. So maybe it's Neo, which is interesting. Okay, so uh, uh, the answer uh, is basically uh, there is no reason. Uh, I'm giving that out, uh, but I think it's interesting to uh, to go through uh, some reasons why people believe it's a that tradition. So uh, the roadmap, roadmap for this uh, uh, talk is that I will first uh, introduce my view on what computationalism is, then I will go through uh, some of the objections against computationalism, and then I will share the happy end uh, with you. So uh, computationalism, uh, that's probably a slightly uh, different view that I had in the paper, or it wasn't uh, explicit in the paper that I shared with you and not explicit in the book, is that I don't think it's a theory. I think it's a research tradition, meaning that it's, it's a broad umbrella under which you can find numerous accounts, including uh, Fedorian ones, but not only. And I try to show that there are at least four different strands in my book, but there are, of course, much, much more, uh, many, there are many, many accounts that you could find there. And uh, one of them is also kind of embodied computation, if you wish, or inactive computation. I will not go into that uh, in this talk. So the basic assumption that I think most of these computational uh, theories or sketches of theories, because most of them are not really full-blown theories, uh, they would accept the basic assumption that the cognitive system, uh, sometimes maybe called the mind, I don't think the mind is a scientific term, it's not really playing any real role in, in our theories in, in psychology or neuroscience, but it's a nice honorific term that we keep. Uh, so the cognitive system is a kind of a computer, which again, is an information processing device or a computational device. Some people quibble about the difference between those two, but I try to say that actually this is the same. And the reason for this, uh, for accepting this basic assumption is that cognition is basically impossible without information processing. Uh, that is the vanilla flavor of computationalism. You could have more, you could require much more than this. Uh, notice that I'm only saying that cognition is impossible without information processing, which makes it a necessary uh, condition, not a sufficient one. And there would be people like Alan Newell or Herb Simon who would say that it's both sufficient and necessary uh, uh, if something is a, comp uh, if and only if something is a, a computational device, it is a cognitive device or a cognitive system. And I also think that for most proponents of this claim, uh, this is not just a mere metaphor, but a literal truth, which could be falsified, which could be uh, proven wrong, uh, which is very, very difficult for metaphors. If you say it's a metaphor, uh, you are on the one hand dismissing it, and on the other hand, you're making it very difficult to actually disprove it. So I think it's, it's nicer to start with the literal version of it. Uh, the role of computation models in cognitive neuroscience or cognitive science is immense. Uh, I think it was Jerome Busemeyer uh, in one of his books uh, who wrote that 80 to 90 percent of theoretical publications in cognitive neuroscience refer to computational models. Uh, that means this is this is the way people want to present their work. Uh, those computation models may be about real systems and purely notional systems. So that doesn't mean that you have to model something that is really out there. So theoretical work could be still done on uh, fairly simplistic idealized systems. And usually people who uh, advocate for uh, computational modeling, uh, they stress one virtue of that, one virtue being that it makes theorizing much more precise than verbal theorizing, which is much more ambiguous. It does not mean that you cannot be ambiguous with computational modeling. I think it happens a lot, especially when you confuse your uh, programming tricks with, uh, uh, with what is considered to be the core of the theory, but that's a, 
that's that's uh, basically uh, something that you have to add to your uh, software code or or whatever way you are trying to represent your computational model with. Now, let me go to objections to uh, uh, to the basic assumption. Uh, I've covered already the, the first one, the computer metaphor. Uh, I think uh, the one rebuttal is very simple. Most computation models are assumed to be literally true or false. People uh, standardly try to validate those models, not only verify whether they uh, are uh, compatible with the assumptions of what should be modeled, but also actually can check whether the data is uh, somehow uh, presented, uh, predicted, or described in a model. It just, it just depends on the function of the model. There are many, many ways you could use such models. Another conceptual objection is that, well, look, software is not in the head. And I think this is, this is something you can find very quickly in m many philosophical discussions. People would say, well, it's unrealistic to think that there is a Turing tape or a Turing machine tape or a code in a programming, high level programming language in your brain. So there is no software in the brain. So there is no, no reason to think that the mind is software implemented by the brain. But no, this is, something that a very specific kind of computational theory of mind claims, not the basic assumption. So you could actually claim that. It's fine, you could defend that. I think Gualtiero Piccinini defends a certain sophisticated version of that, uh, actually redefining the notion of software, but it's not something which is contained in the basic vanilla version, basic assumption that all these computational uh, 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 approaches, sure. And there are some uh, conceptual objections that I consider uh, much more easy to answer, such as that computers only are used for crunching numbers. That, I think that that was an objection that is already dead since the 50s. Uh, so it's actually very clear that I'm uh, showing you my slides, which is something slightly different than just crunching numbers. Some people would think that computers are abstract entities, not real ones. I don't un really understand what they mean because they usually pay uh, a lot of money to get a real concrete object uh, uh, that actually requires some uh, uh, electricity to work with, which is not true for abstract entities. So uh, computers are not just abstract entities. The mathematical models we describe computers with are abstract. Uh, entities, but these are two different things. So if you think that computationalism actually requires you to believe that uh, anything in you in the biology of the brain is abstract, uh, not physical, uh, you are confusing the mathematical model and you're being platonist, uh, platonist about mathematical entities. At the same time, uh, not really thinking that those things are run on uh, physical computers. This is related to something which I think is a much more sophisticated version of the abstract entity objection, which is the objection that computers are in some sense disembodied. So they lack a biological body. Uh, why would we actually be worried about this? Well, there are two reasons given, I believe, in the literature. The first one is that they should be lacking biological normativity. And people in an activist camp or an interactivist camp would say such a thing. So they would say, well, this AI machine is very nice, but it doesn't have the biological function, which would give the, fun, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, underpinning for anything that this computer might be actually doing in a cognitive fashion. So biological normativity is supposed to be this super something that gives the, the, real, the real AI, not the fake AI that we might have on uh, silicon computers. Uh, this, I think, requires much more unpacking than is usually done, mostly because 
There are some people who have defended computational theory of mind, such as my friend Walter Piccinini, and he says that uh, actually uh, computers are things, mechanisms that have a biological function because they actually allow biological agents to fulfill their goals. Uh, isn't that biological normativity? Well, if you're a, an activist, you would probably say, well, that makes them not properly normative because they, it's not their own normativity. These computers are in the service of some other agents. So these computers, to be really cognitive, they would have to be actually uh, embedded in a real biological agent. Uh, if you're in AI, you should worry about this uh, if you if you think this is, this is a real uh, objection. But if you are a computational model, modeler in cognitive science, you would say, well, the brains are exactly that. So uh, why should I worry? Uh, it's a computer and it's uh, actually embedded in a biological individual. So that's one version of this. Computers are disembodied objection. Uh, the second version is uh, a slightly different. It, I think it, it's been uh, spelled out in, in uh, uh, the recent, well, not so recent, but the, the, now the last book by Terry Deacon, maybe he ha has some 500 pages ma uh, manuscript uh, uh, ready to be published waiting, but uh, in his last book, In Complete Nature, he says that uh, biological individuals have a certain very specific organization that allows them to have this kind of uh, uh, normativity function, which is very important. And you don't have to be very in, in the inactive camp to, to believe that this is a serious thing because Dan Dennett in his last book, From Bacteria to Back, uh, actually he, he uh, he seems to embrace the point and to say that he was he was guilty for understanding computer architectures as a kind of hierarchical politburo kind of organization in which all tasks are neatly uh, divided among uh, constituents. But at the same time, uh, it's it's not big big news. Uh, Dan remains a computationalist because he thinks that you could have a flexible computer architecture to uh, to work with. So uh, these are the conceptual objections, which I think uh, are, are interesting, but quite easily answered. Now let's go to something which is related to the issue of meaning. That's the first uh, objection related to meaning. Uh, this is something that defenders of ecological psychology would say. They would say cognition is just pickup of information after James Gibson. Uh, so information is picked up, not processed, according to them. Uh, I'm, I'm actually still in the dark what, is, what this is supposed to mean. Uh, and uh, this is because uh, they seem to presuppose that the notion of information processing uh, actually uh, uh, some, in some way assumes that there is a rich uh, database in the computer or something like that, which is always added on top of any uh, kind of information you're processing or something like that. So uh, you are not picking up information if you are, uh, according, that would be the story of uh, uh, ecological psychologists. You, you are not simply picking up informa uh, information if you are trying to, to make an AI machine. This AI machine has to do a lot of additional work by adding some information to the input data, and that makes information processing in, uh, in contrast to information pickup. I still do not really understand what this means because I think uh, uh, you might, uh, I think what, what is actually at, uh, in the background here is the assumption that they actually think is shared by computationalists, namely that computationalism requires something like uh, top-down processing, something that uh, strong versions of predictive processing, for example, assume that there is a lot of uh, top-down inference 
that is uh, required to uh, for to achieve uh, I don't know uh, perceptual uh, constancies or anything like that. According to James Gibson, of course, the, all these things are bottom up rather than top down. But I don't think it's a basic assumption. I think this is just in the in the debate uh, over inferentialism in perception, not uh, about computationalism. So I think this is slightly uh, misleading to frame this uh, uh, objection like this. Uh, moreover, you might think, and many people in computationalism uh, camp would say so, that semantic properties are not really required uh, to make computational models. Uh, you can have a computer without semantics, uh, they would say, and I do say that as well, because I think you can have a very stupid computer that works on things that do not refer to anything outside the system, so they do not have their own intentionality or whatever you, you can call it. Uh, you could have computers like that, and it's easy to have that. It's much more difficult to have real intentional representations that are about the entities which are outside uh, the computational system. So uh, in some ways, uh, this semantic objection might be rebutted this way, that you don't have to believe in representations to start with. And there are anti-representational computationalists out there. So uh, basically, this is not something you could you, you should uh, uh, embrace automatically. But at the same time, I believe it's a, it's a kind of a cheap answer. It's a cheap answer because most people who defend computationalism, they also think that representations are important and are useful. Uh, so let's go straight ahead to the well-known uh, Chinese room, uh, which attacks this uh, straight on. This objection, of course, is supposed to say that computers, by the very fact that they are computers, they have to lack, lack intentionality. Uh, because there are no semantic properties in computers. Of course, you could use my cheap answer and say, well, computational does not require you to have uh, genuine intentionality. Uh, but I would say something slightly different that maybe makes my view neo-Fedorian. I would say that representation requires computation, but not vice versa. So. Uh, Jerry would say that the, uh, no computation without representation, and I say something slightly different, no representation without computation. So this is a slightly different view. Uh, I will not spend much time on this. Of course, I, I, can, I can speak hours and hours about this because I, I've, I've, I think this is one of the very complex issues here. But the thing is that most theories of representation or intentionality, which are considered to be the standard or uh, the best worked out theories of intentionality in philosophy, uh, they usually do not presuppose any, anything like the view that compu computation is sufficient for uh, genuine representation. Uh, so theory of semantics developed by Ruth uh, Garrett Millikan basically requires a lot a lot more than just uh, computation. It requires that there is a certain structure that has a proper function of presenting signs from a, a producer to a consumer and that there, these signs would have a, a certain mapping function to reality and so on and so on. I don't wanna, want to uh, I don't want to uh, present the full view of teleo semantics. I usually have to, to when in, I introduce that in, to my students, I, I usually uh, need two 90-minute uh, lectures to present uh, all the intric intricacies of the view. But the idea is that you need a lot more than just computation. But I think you need computation because without information, and without semantic information, semantic information which is about something, there is no way to have representation. So cognitive representation requires semantic 
information. But semantic information is a notion which I understand uh, uh, to be slightly uh, less demanding than cognitive representation. Namely, semantic information just has to be uh, accurate. It could be true or false or fo followed or not, depending whether it's instructional or declarative information. But it need not have any users or producers. So you might have semantic information out there in, uh, in the smoke that is produced by fire, which informs you about fire. But it doesn't mean that uh, the fire is intentionally informing you about the fire. Uh, there is no, actually, no producer here. And uh, the information is out there. But it, of course, you could use fire as a kind of a representation uh, yourself. But that's a different story. And let me just uh, be true to my uh, saying that I will not spend much time on this. So let me go to architectural objections. That's number one. That there is no real time in computers. Dynamicists would say so. Turing machine operations are not in real time. If you look at specification of Turing machine, it operates in abstract time of steps, discrete steps. Well, what they are confusing here, they are confusing the mathematical model of computation with computation itself. That's one thing. And of course, in a mathematical model of computation, you could also have timing of individual steps specified whichever way you want. And there is actually one formalism that actually adds this timing to Turing machine. It's not very useful, though, to have that. But you could have that if you, if you need that, uh, probably if you are, are interested in uh, real-time computation in, because you're running uh, software for a nuclear plant, you would be really interested in that. But if you're, if you're doing uh, theoretical computer science, probably you want to get rid of uh, everything which is uh, so detailed as that. Second objections, architectural objection. Computers cannot be conscious. Uh, I, I hate using the C word. This is something that actually connects me with Jerry Fodor as well. But uh, I think we have to talk about it uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, what you're seeing on my slide is actually the uh, inside of an old mill in a Polish village. Uh, because this is something that reminds me of the old objection against mechanical explanation that Leibniz had in the 17th century. He said, well, perception cannot be uh, understood mechanically or using a mechanism because we could imagine that this mechanism is as big as a mill. You would enter the mill, look around, and perceptions will not be seen, which means that uh, perceptions or contents is not uh, physical. You could, of course, now use the C word here. Consciousness wouldn't be seen in a computer. Uh, again, the basic assumption shared by many computationalists, and probably most of them, is that Consciousness is not necessarily reducible to computational properties. Maybe it requires something more. And it's not really something very strange if you're saying that. It doesn't make consciousness really very physically special. You might say that uh, there are some properties of computers which are not reducible to their uh, purely computational properties. For example, uh, a, a compute, you might have you, a computer that was used by a very well-known uh, uh, celebrity on YouTube, and that celebrity actually signed that computer. Well, it's it's still a computer, but the property of being signed, uh, of, of having a, a signature of a celebrity, is not reducible to the computational property. While the inscription on a computer is still a physical thing, so it's not really something that makes Consciousness non physical. It's not something that actually uh, opens the Pandora box of, of some dualism or anything like that. You might simply deny that it, it is computationally explainable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a lively research on machine consciousness. I do not track this uh, uh, closely. Uh, 
I think it just depends uh, on uh, on a on a lot of things. One of them being what what we actually understand by consciousness. This is by far not a clear term, uh, and many people actually claim that this is a false psychology term that actually, under close inspection, turns out to be uh, something like a collection of uh, several overlapping notions. I think Elizabeth. Irvine makes this uh, point in her uh, book uh, about consciousness as a scientific concept that actually uh, when you look at from look at consciousness from the measurement point of view how it's measured in uh, experiments it turns out that there are many notions of consciousness out there I don't take a stance on that but uh, it's important to to note that it's that uh, the uh, definitive answer on whether machine consciousness is possible or not simply depends on whether we understand what consciousness is and this is surely difficult to say i don't think the verdict is is clear at this at this moment even though we uh, all uh, mature theories of consciousness that we know of are all uh, actually uh, phrased in information or computational terms, starting from, of course, uh, information integration theory to, through global workspace theory uh, and so on. So also the higher order theories of consciousness are also uh, framed in computational uh, language. So uh, the mainstream theories of consciousness are already computational, whether it, they will become, the, one of them is the final theory of consciousness, I don't know. Uh, third art architectural objection, it, it comes from a popular paper by uh, Epstein, uh, who claimed that people do not remember things as computers do. Uh, he gave his uh, 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 students a, um, a task to draw one dollar, and the top uh, picture shows how they draw it and uh, the the bottom one is is the one that uh, is the picture that they would draw when looking at at uh, one dollar so he would say human memory is uh is is much much less precise than computer memory because computers will not be able to uh to do anything like that i think it's a red herring uh because lossy compression does exist and you can have uh, a lot of abstraction computers. I will not spend any more time on this. Uh, fourth objection is that brains are analog computers. Uh, uh, Gerard Edelman, I have a, a Polish edition of his uh, uh, book here. Uh, he would say that brains are not computers because they are not digital, they are analog. But analog computation is still computation as Corey Mell especially would say. So this is computationalism as well. I, I said nothing in what I believe is a basic assumption of the whole research tradition. Hava Siegelman would say brains go beyond the Turing machines. So they are hyper computational. Uh, I don't think that computational and core claim uh, reduces uh, to some claims about uh, classical universal Turing machines. Uh, you could add some additional assumptions. You could uh, add assumptions about hyper computation or uh, classical computation, uh, but the basic claim, uh, which is shared by the whole tradition, I think it doesn't say anything like that. Now let's go to AI objections, maybe more interesting here. Uh, the, I think it, there, there, is, there is a number of arguments that have the, the following form. People phi or people do X, computer will never phi or do X, thus AI is impossible and computational is false, because people have some property that computers will never have. Uh, but it's crucial, uh, what, what is substituted by X in premise one and two? Uh, not, only one, not only two, as I have on my slides. Well, of course, people drink Coke. Should computers drink Coke? Uh, well, that's silly, of course. But what counts? Should this embodiment that I mentioned already as a conceptual uh, objection. As you can see, uh, this is not a clear taxonomy that I'm using here, just, just uh, some way of organizing the objections. What counts? I think the interesting candidates, the most, the most important for 
AI people uh, are candidates that refer or appeal to cognitive or information related features of human beings because these would be very difficult to rebut. So one version of this says that it's really difficult to implement common sense inference. Uh, I think a lot of discussion here uh, goes under the, uh, the misnomer uh, frame problem, which is an original problem that originated in a very specific logical uh, calculus. Uh, logical calculus is very rarely, if ever, used nowadays in uh, AI. Logicist AI, of course, exists but it's a fringe thing as compared to the mainstream work. So a uh, frame problem does not exist uh, uh, in a literal sense. And in non-literal sense, it's, it's basically saying that common sense reasoning uh, uh, is, is very difficult to implement on computers because it's even very difficult to say what common sense inference is. So implementing that is difficult ipso facto because you don't know what it is but i think there is progress on this uh joshua barhila would say machine translation will never be possible at least accurate one but i think it's now we all agree that it it becomes intelligible uh uh weizenbaum uh, the creator of the the well-known uh Elizabeth, I just wanted to say that we have a few minutes and we want, we need to move on to the discussion, if that's okay. Okay, okay. This is, I won't spend much more time on this. So I think the common sense objection was the most important one. So I've come to the, to the all, all, all other things. I think other objections are red herring, Stromer, Strowman or they attack extremely radical brands of computationalism. That's why they are toothless, uh, excuse my very bad joke. So that was what I wanted to say today. Okay. Didn't mean to cut it too short. If there are some slides that you would like to have up, it might help everyone, especially since there were a lot of questions of clarification. So feel free if you want a couple of minutes to have some slides. So, so maybe so, Martine, you just, to put as you, as, well, you did say at the end that on yeah. the last slide that common sense is the biggest objection. Um, maybe yeah. the, the, the most. Maybe you could just say a few more lines, like Ida said, about why you think the common sense objection is the most concerning one. Because we've had that before. Melanie Mitchell very much made that case. Uh, so I think it'd be very nice to hear you just unpack why you think that's the biggest. Yeah hurdle it's 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 the biggest one because it's still you could you could have uh, uh experiments on human subjects that uh, are able to do certain things uh they apparently are able to perform certain things up uh, uh, even even uh, even uh, kids and it's very difficult to say why they do that why they think that certain things happen uh, uh why uh, why the uh why moving a, a, a ball uh, on a surface will not destroy the ball or something like that. So making very uh, a lot of assumptions, uh, uh, you would say, from the inferentialist point of view. But it's very difficult to model this, to understand how it actually happens. I think this is the most important objection in a sense that it requires a lot more experimental work that we already have. It requires understanding a lot more in, about human psychology, but I don't think it's a, it's a, an, a, it's an objection that it's deadly. It simply says that people underestimate the difficulty of of uh, 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 tasks that we commonly perform, uh, uh, but we are unaware of their complexity. So I think it's it's. Is the complexity that we don't see because it's automated in, in many ways. Uh, how we do things, how we infer things, how we infer that the uh, water would fall down from a cup when we actually move the cup in, in a cer certain way. But uh, it's automatic in us. We don't think about it. It's, it seems uh, very simple to us, but it's it's far from being simple, actually. I think it's a, it's a, 
there's a lot of a uh, lot of going on but it's totally inaccessible by introspection or, or uh, unavailable for verbal report that's why people think it's simple and that's why i think common sense or intuition are names for things that we do not really understand your computer your mic is off can we start asking you questions or would you like to say uh any more from your slides? Uh, I think that was the most important thing. I don't think I I, I want to go through Gedel uh, proof because it's uh, everyone know Penrose and, and things like that. So I think it's a okay, it's a great. Um, so look, thank you very much. I think it it, it really is a nice uh, follow on from what we've had. Um, so um, it seems to me on that last issue about you know artificial general intelligence common sense you know the list that lake and co made um but though that's not an objection to a computational view right doesn't it seem to be more an objection to the kind of representations that we're still going to need to know how to build in order to then do computations on those you know, I I, I I give the I gave the example I think um, to Blake Richards when he was on. I said, look, think of a word like Mississippi. Count the number of S's in the word Mississippi. Say Mississippi backwards. Right? If you're saying Mississippi backwards or counting the number of S's in Mississippi, you're taking a representation of a word and you're doing a computation on it. You're adding up the number of S's. Now, is it true, I'm asking you this, that we don't really know how we float the word Mississippi in our head and add up the S's in it, right? Now, that seems to be more of a representational problem than anything else. And so I was wondering if you'd say whether you feel what kind of progress are we going to have to make if meaning is going to require representations that are about something that you can actually, as Ramsey said, perform on? Are we anywhere near understanding that in neuroscience or mimicking it in AI? Well, my own view uh, on this is a bit complex, uh, but I, I would surely say that this objection is not against computationalism per se. That's, that's one thing. Uh, you might be a computationalist, a computationalist and say that artificial intelligence is impossible. Brains are computers, but you cannot mimic it in a computer because it's too complex. That's still possible. That's a pessimistic view, but it's 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 logically coherent. So you need to, to have something more to to say that it's possible to mimic it on a different kind of a uh, of a hardware. Uh, maybe it's simply vastly too complex or something like that. So it's AI objection. So it's very specific version of computationalism. I agree. Now, I would also think that a lot of these uh, uh, objections are posed against representational views. Hubert Dreyfus was uh, uh, definitely doing that. So he was against uh, representational views on comp uh, in computationalism. And he was thinking that, uh, in particular, Simon and Newell approach will never work uh, because he thought it would lead to uh, some kind of uh, a combinatory explosion of representation or something like that. Uh, but I think uh, representation, I, I, I have an, a certain kind of impression of, of progress on this issue because I, I believe uh, the current discussion on representation is now uh, uh, trying to, to focus on, on, uh, on several features that uh, seem to be more and more popular to be uh, assumed. Uh, I defend the view that representation should be in some way important for the individual or for the system that, it, that uh, actually has the representation. So it, having that representation should, uh, sh the, that that system should care about this representation and to be more precise uh, there should be some procedures that actually check for the for the adequacy but isn't that just isn't just isn't that just intentionality that the representation has to be about something for the organism 
Yes, but not only just about something for the organism, but for the organism, I understand a little bit more precise. So if you're trying to uh, say, understand what, what place cells do, well, maybe there are the, uh, in some circumstances, uh, uh, when, when rats are asleep, they are presenting a, a, a map or something like that, very simplistic topographical map. Suppose that's true. If that's true, there should be some procedures that actually check for the adequacy of that map and check, change the map when any kind of error is detected. So they, uh, so it's operated, so it's available for the system and the system actually does something to the syntax of the representation by changing it, adapting it, and then uh, using it. Otherwise, it could be just something that has a causal role, but it's not a, a, a representational role in the system. It could be just like a, a photo cell that uh, uh, opens. No, I, I understand. I understand. But, yeah. not, but I, I think you're always going to the sort of uh, counterfactual what it couldn't be. But I'm just saying we're, we're trying to stick to the that there are, there are representations that are functional that you do refer to, which you do update. And I guess once one, and my last question for you is if there are representations about things and have intentionality, um, then do you think that some people have argued that once you talk about intentionality, that's closer to functionalism than the mechanistic view? So the last question I have for you is, do you think that once you talk about semantics and intentional representations, that there will always be a dual language? There'll be a functional language for psychology and there'll be an implementational language for neuroscience? Or do you think that even with this semantic representational puzzle and meaning, that we will be able to have a language which itself is not representational, it's sub-representational components that will explain the representational stuff which seems to live in the world of functionalism and psychology. So I, I just feel like maybe we're just gonna have to deal with complementarity forever in our language because of intentionality. I was wondering if... Well, well I'm a staunch mechanist here. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we... we uh, I defended the view with my postdoc, Paolo Wojcicki, uh, uh, that actually uh, you can show that contents has causal relevance for explaining uh, success. Uh, uh, so you can explain why a certain organism achieved a certain goal uh, with a certain uh, degree of success by saying that the representation that it had, structural representation, so the one that is based on resemblance, resembled the target entity in a, in a sufficient manner so that the goal would be achieved in this. Uh, so it, there would be some kind of correspondence between the similarity of the representation to the target and the success. And that's a causal thing, not a functional one. Yeah, but it's causal at a, it's it's causal without having to get all implementational, right? Well, in general, when you go to to how it actually works, you don't need to talk about functional things anymore. I mean, they are maybe they are specified in in abstract terms, but they are still. I mean, the way philosophers use the the talk of functional functionalism and functional is so ambiguous that it's very difficult to to clear this up but the idea is that mostly people who are denying mechanism they are they're saying that it's there are no components there are no operations which are important for your explanation it's just some kind of abstract structure so i'm saying the components will be also important so understand for example if this uh, simplistic story about the topographic representation in a, in a sleeping rat is true, then you might actually explain why the rat got the reward uh, by saying it had an accurate representation of the maze it was uh, actually located in. And that, that's why it, it happened. Uh, and you need to actually uh, refer to, to uh, the exact firings in, in the place, uh, place cells. No, th there is no function that you have to go up. I mean, this, this is the same thing. Sorry, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to interject there because um, 
I actually build models of replay and, and uh, Kim also is here. Both of us use reinforcement learning and representation learning models to address hippocampal, medial temporal lobe representation of space. And I disagree with you. And I think philosophy has been clear. I'd like to evoke, I mean, I don't know if it's uh, uh, sort of um, probably a little out of fashion, but I really liked anomalous monism. And I think that it's pretty clear there what's going on, which is that you have a different level of a different level of explanation that can be at a higher level, let's say the word money, and then you have physical or sort of uh, implementations or realizations of money in the physical realm. There is no type type identity that happens there. There are some mechanisms, different kinds of mechanisms that could uh, enable the function of money or the object money. But in order to address all of them in a way that you can find the laws that govern it, you might need to look at a higher level. Likewise, if we are thinking about, for instance, the concept of replay, if we are thinking about the concept of um, even representation of places or locations, we don't need cells exactly the way that mammals have right now, exactly the way that rats have right now. Uh, in fact, a recent paper that I had the, uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed reviewing is one where it used a very well-known robotics model that was not designed for biology at all called SLAM, which is, uh, had been used in drones, in uh, self-driving cars, in sort of uh, robots, and then showed that that model can capture a lot of the properties of uh, play cells and grid cells and the uh, joint replay of grid cells and um, play cells as well as uh, so many other factors about synchronization of them that had not been, for instance, addressed with other models before. So I think there is a very important way in which some functions were captured by that computational model without having anything to do with neural representations, but the functions got it so right because it was simultaneously localizing and mapping, that's uh, short for SLAM, or the SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. It had uh, the, the idea, the functional level was so well done that it actually captured more things at the lower level in terms of experiments having to do with grid cells and plate cells than what was expected if we had just started from there. So in fact, there seems to be that that is the very notion of functionalism, right? Where the exact mechanism might not matter as much as truly capturing the function. Well, uh, it depends on, on your uh, goals, how you actually look at nature and how you actually, uh, actually talk about kinds. One thing which is important is that you are saying these mechanisms are different. Well, different uh, from what point of view? You could, you could, you could say that dogs are multiply realized because there are so many kinds of dogs. They, they look differently. Well, this is not multiple realization. They are just one species. No, no, no. We're talking about rodent versus robots. Definitely different. Uh, well, definitely. Mm -hmm. And, and my, I think my, my postdoc also, uh, former postdoc Mateusz Hochel is working on crickets. They do not have, definitely they don't have place cells. And he, he works on exactly that, whether they have geometric representation of, of, of that or not. So, uh, and uh, so insects are de definitely don't, don't have the same machinery, right? But they might have, uh, they might share properties, abstract properties of mechanisms. Whether you can, you can ca you call them functional or not, I think it's, it's, it's a terminology distinction. It's not really essential. The thing is that there are lots of detail in many explanations that do not count in many cases. And you can discard them because they are not essential. Because there are similarities that, if you want to 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 say that this entity did something in a similar way that another, and that's why it worked. Well, you don't need to talk about differences unless you are interested in the differences. Then, well, the differences. Why the rat did that in a different way than the robot? Then you go to the differences. I'm going to well, again. Oh, sorry, I'm going. I was very specific in my comment. I'm going to again evoke anomalous monism. We are talking. Well, I mean, about that you're you're talking about. I, I understand your point. I understand so your I, point perfectly. I need to finish this. So it's at some level you're saying that there are no differences at the level of behavior, and I would agree with you. But the whole point of functional, the whole point of people who talk about mechanisms at the neural level or chemical level or synaptic level is at a much lower level than behavior. 
So we, we have to specify on which level are we defining function, on which level are we defining mechanism. Mechanism is typically a circuit level in neuroscience. It's not at the level of behavior. So you're, I would agree with you if you're saying, I'm a functionalist, behavior is the same at the higher level. Yes, we are on the same uh, sort of camp to some extent, not entirely, because uh, you know there's like limits to behavior as well. We can say in this very specific experiment where we designed this particular model to explicitly do only this, the behavior is comparable. So it's again, like, you know, a question of how we can say that is the same. Well, the thing is that philosophers understand the term mechanism in a much more abstract functional terms than you are presupposing. Uh, and a mechanism, according to Bill Bechtel, Carl Craver, is just a structure, causal structure that has components that perform certain operations and is organized. I, Ida, can I just defend the, Ida? I want to just, just, just to say for Ida, I mean, I think it's a little bit, you know, Carl Craver has slipped all over the place. Sometimes it really was um, physically located, spatially located objects. It was physical. And then he slipped out of that and began to say that they could be abstract. Well, if, if you're allowed to use the word mechanism anywhere you like on abstract objects, physical objects, circuits, well, then, OK. That then, then, then mechanism becomes so universal that it ceases to do interesting work. At least when Carl Craver did his original work, he physically wanted impingement of object A on object B. Circuit neuron A is connected to neuron B, which is what Ida's saying. There, it was physical, spatial, temporal placement in the world. If you now say that you can become more abstract, well, that's just functionalism in another name. Well, there is a difference, uh, which is that if you're a functionalist, uh, you have to actually say that most functionalists at, the, at least did that, that certain uh, features of mechanisms or physical features will never be relevant to your explanation. And you should never include them in your explanation. You should never talk about the, this detail because it's irrelevant. Uh, knowing uh, uh, brain uh, structure is as relevant uh, for the cognitive scientist as knowing quantum mechanics for a car mechanic, as Zelon Polishin would say. This is what functionalism would say. That there is a certain kind of abstract level uh, which is defined in a very woolly way, be below which you shouldn't go because you should stay as abstract as this. And I think this is this is not the uh, the way uh, things went on in neuroscience, and also uh, I think Bill Bechtel and uh, did a lot of work on this, and preceding a lot of, of what Carl did on this, and the 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 easy way of understanding that those abstract properties are not really. Uh, understood by many people in philosophy as being non-spatio-temporal. If you're Aristotelian, which is, I think, mainstream position for many philosophers, you're saying that, you know, being round is a proper, is a physical property of objects. You can be a nominalist, you can make that mistake. I had a, a PhD student who defended his dissertation being a nominalist, okay? That, that's fine, but I'm not. I think it's a physical property being round. Uh, or having a certain shape. We said ge geometrical shape. It's physically out there. So I think it's in the object. Uh, that's why I think it's just the, the, the way you're defining this. It's just, I think it's, a, it's, it's dangerously close to a terminological difference. I disagree. Well, I think... <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, after Jovo, maybe we can start taking questions. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I fully understand. Can, can you hear me? Okay, I think Ida fully understands. And I don't think she presupposed what, what you were saying. I think uh, she disagrees with you rather than fail to understand the arguments. Um, so uh, I have a completely different um, line of, of thinking and questioning that, that neither John nor Ida has, has touched on. And that is, I, I come mostly from a statistics and neuroscience background. So in statistics, it's very commonly said, George Fox quipped, all models are wrong and some are useful. 
And, and you even alluded to this a little bit, I think, when you talked about, you know, uh, the, the perfect model would be useless because it's just the whole thing again, right? So this computational model is a model. So it's, it's definitely wrong, right? There's no, there's no doubt, it's not true. It, it's, it's unambiguously wrong because it doesn't capture everything. So the question of interest isn't really whether it's right or wrong. The question of interest is in which ways is it useful? And, and perhaps the more interesting question is in which ways is it currently failing? Because once we understand the ways in which it fails, um, we can try to improve it. And I would just, you know, in contrast, there, there's other models like, uh, and I, I like the Bradenberg's vehicles book a lot, where there's really no representation whatsoever, but there's just a bunch of organisms that happen to replicate and they tend to replicate more when they exhibit certain kinds of behaviors. There's no goal, there's no intentionality, there's no explicit representation. There's also no, he doesn't explain how you get to cognition per se, but there's no reason it couldn't get to cognition as far as I can tell. And so I think that's just a completely different model which has a lot of nice properties. And I, I wanna hear your perspective on what you think are the limitations of this particular model and what other models may have to bear to improve our collective accounting of, of cognitive processing? Thanks for this. This is a, a very interesting question. Uh, well, and one way you can think of, if you're a scientific realist, you would say that idealization is useful or works or idealized models work just because there is something true that they capture. So it's that the usefulness actually is a, is a weasel term, is a weasel phrase. It's useful. Why is it useful? You can always ask that question, which uh, anti-realist approaches to modeling uh, have problems with. They might, might say, well, they are all wrong and they will turn out to be wrong. We are all pessimistic. They, they are all just, well, some are suspiciously successful for, for a long time. So it's, I think it's, uh, it's not a very successful answer saying being pessimistic about everything. So the, they are useful uh, according to realists because they capture some part of reality, uh, probably something essential about the phenomenon they are trying to capture. A lot of things that, uh, in, that science uh, is interested in uh, is just very, very tiny a uh, bit of what's going on. A lot of other things we're not interested in. We do not want, want to replicate it in a perfect model. A perfect model is as useless as the real thing because we don't know how it works. So we want to have it simpler and we want to have the simpler thing because we believe that there is something that the simpler thing shares with the target. It shares the essential structure and we can play with the structure to understand the structure, to, to to actually wiggle it in, in certain ways, to see what works and what not. So I think uh, basically that, that would be a, a useful way. And now with, with vehicles, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, book with, with lots of uh, thought experiments on robots, uh, some of which are still not replicable physically because the materials are not out there which is surprising given the date of publishing. Uh, uh, with, I think it was 84, so a lot of time, but we still cannot actually build a, a lot of them. Uh, but it, it, it was one, uh, one in, in zillion of similar approaches to, uh, to, to animate modeling or uh, artificial creature modeling out there that, sh that has shown that compl complex dynamics can stem from very simple agents with very simple structure. And I think everyone appreciates that, that complex behavior can be produced by very simple structures or relatively simple. Uh, whether, I don't think that all things that people call cognitive or are studied by cognitive neuroscience are necessarily representational. Uh, I, I have an example of a cricket in my book. I don't think that phonotaxis uh, uh, approaching the, the, this, uh, the, the sound source is, is representational in a cricket. It, it's just, it just approaches this a certain kind of sound. 
uh, uh, by trying to make the signal stronger and stronger. That, that's a very simple thing, but it's not representational. Uh, it's perceptual, but it's not, not representational. Uh, so I think, you know, a lot of things you might uh, achieve without representation in, in this specific intentional, genuine intentional sense. Uh, but it's still, there is still some uh, semantic information going on uh, that the cricket actually does not operate in. It doesn't really process. A lot of physical morphology does it in a cricket. So I think uh, a lot of similar things, but in a simpler manner than in the physical cricket uh, go, uh, is going on in, in vehicles uh, of Reitenberg. So I think that the first highly voted question from the audience is from Jovo. And maybe you want to ask that. And afterwards, maybe Kim, you already you mentioned you might uh, be able to come on stage. Maybe ne next Kim can be on stage. And okay. Everyone, if you can come to, to the stage to ask your question, please mention in the chat. So. so my question was, was really one of uh, clarification. And I'll just read it. What are the necessary and sufficient conditions for a cognitive model to be computational? Uh, I think a lot of the discussions in the chat are would be informed by hearing what, what you mean when you say it is a computational model or not one. That's an interesting question. Uh, well, the way I understand it is that uh, computational models are usually uh, stated in some some uh, computational way. So uh, you use a certain kind of formalism or software or some kind of uh, uh, Turing machine formalism or uh, kind of mathematical formalism that is usually understood by computational theories in mathematics as computational. I know it sounds uh, slightly circular, but I think the decision what to call computational is not up to philosophers. It's up to math mathematics and computer science. So what they call, and they have reasons to do that usually. So uh, if it's part of computer science and computability theory, it's probably a, computa a model of computation. If that's stated by using that kind of formalism, that's, that's a computational model. That, that I would say, uh, if it's stated in some other way, which is strongly dissimilar, it's probably not a computation model. So uh, a theory stated in uh, Polish language is not a computational model, unless it is stated in such a way that actually those sentences are isomorphic to a Turing machine, but it's, it's highly improbable. I'm out of focus a lot of times, I'm sorry. Kim, uh, <laughs> that can be at different levels. Uh, Kim, you can uh, go ahead, and your your question got a lot of votes, so you can read it the way it was, or you can uh, just you know say it however you'd like. Okay. Am I allowed to first ask a follow up question on that previous question, or do you want us to go on? Okay. Um, I was wondering. So um, at the beginning of the talk, you referred to computation as like generic information processing, and that seems like a really different version than like that which is described for the computational model. Well, I, I believe that uh, models of computation in, in computer science actually describe those things that are uh, processing information. It's just a different terminology to talk about the same thing. Uh, I, I could go on and my, my intuition comes from Markov algorithms, but that, that, I think it, it would go into my own biography rather than into an argument. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I guess I was, um, this This maybe segues into my question kind of well, but I was thinking that there are some things that are very hard to articulate, but describe something that is like information processing just in a way that's not very, compu it's not expressed in the mathematically precise terms that you would use to say something's a, math a computational model, but you might say it's like you're describing computation, just not with that level of precision. Um, relatedly, the question I had for you was about common sense. Um, and um, uh, the basically my question is just what were some examples of common sense um because you were saying that this was um the the main obstacle you thought to to the uh, analogy between 
computation and brains. Um, and my understanding of common sense is that it's sort of like folk physics and folk psychology, in which case you could, um, you could think that these would emerge from the natural statistics of tasks combined with some uh, algorithm for learning or evolution. Um, and then it seems like the obstacles to getting these in computers um, with machine learning would be the surmountable engineering one of building better, more naturalistic tasks for agents and getting agents that can interact with the world uh, tractably rather than being like fundamentally not something that computation can embrace. Uh. Actually, I, the things that uh, Dreyfus would uh, mention were usually related to some practical uh, activities of people, like trying to find their way in the woods or asking uh, questions around or things like that. But I don't, don't recall what, what were the, his exact uh, 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 examples. Uh, on, on, from the top of my head, I would have to simply look in, into the book. It's uh, he has two books. Uh, what, one is what computers can do, and the second one uh, commented uh, very critically by some AI people as as the uh, proof that even Dreyfus can learn uh, uh, has the title uh, "What Computers Still Can't Do." So. Uh, he admitted that there was some progress. Uh, I don't really recall what we're, but he was actually trying to say, don't look at chess, don't look at uh, checkers, uh, don't look at tic-tac-toe and, and uh, you know, very well-defined problems. Look at uh, ill-defined problems, how to get meaning in life, how to live well and things like that, which are very, very, very difficult to understand what they actually mean and with folk psychology and and uh, folk physics, uh, folk physics of, of water, things like that, that's probably the one way of actually dealing with that. Um, I'm not a fan of this objection. I don't think it uh, it it has a, a, a lot of force. I think this is the only one that has some force because it requires people to build uh, a lot more uh, successful systems. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of systems are much more successful than people uh, already. So uh, I don't think uh, it's it actually shows that it's a, it's a, some kind of an in principle objection. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy with that answer. I guess I like the idea of like something that computers still can't do, rather than it seeming like fundamentally insurmountable. I'm going to go back into mute land. Uh, just in addition to that. It's so good. First of all, it's so good to see you, Kim. <laughs> and also, uh, I just want to mention that I, I left one link in the comments uh, about Doina Precup's uh, 2020 paper showing uh, the how reinforcement learning can capture the notion of affordances. And she's not the first one either. It's just a um, Gibsonian topic that actually re reinforcement learning and representation learning has been successful at uh, approaching. And another one that I want to mention uh, that I think uh, Melanie Mitchell put the full link to the videos is an entire workshop in Cognitive Science Conference on um, uh, uh, common sense in, a, in humans and machines and the list of videos Melanie Mitchell left it there. So, okay. Uh, the next person, I think, is Adam Charles. Uh, he has the most voted question, if you could invite him on stage. Yeah, he's coming on now. And I just want to say again, thanks, Kim, for joining. I know it can be kind of stressful for people to come up and show their faces, and it, it's great to have you, Kim. And for those of you who don't know, she's got a very active and uh, insightful Twitter feed that I encourage everyone to follow her and hear her and read her all throughout the day and night when she's posting cool stuff. Hi, Adam. Adam, you're here. We can't hear you. Your voice is not, yeah. OK. Something going on in Baltimore. Everyone in Baltimore has technical issues. <laughs> John is frozen, too. Should we invite our next speaker while Adam figures it out for next question? Okay, let me, I'll invite Colin was next, I think. And I'm going to um, unvideo you until you figure out your uh, set.
So while we're waiting, I can just give a little introduction. Colin has been talking with us um, offline and had a bunch of interesting questions. And so I'm not sure he actually posted his question here, but I know what it is. And I think it will be interesting to hear from him once he joins. He's not in Baltimore, so he shouldn't have any technical difficulties. Um, Hi. Okay. Hey, Colin, welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a bit off guard because I, I was sort of prepared to do a bit of a 15 minute thing and, and, uh, and now I'm sort of required to uh, ask a question in lieu of that. And so I'm struggling a bit. Um, the, I suppose for what I wanted to say originally in uh, my little presentation was that is to go actually go meta on the whole thing and ask why this discussion actually goes on. It's going on for 50 years. Um, and I have communicated with the, the guys here about a way of um, putting that discussion in perspective that might be helpful. Now, I'm in neuroscience, and I really don't care what ism is involved in solving this problem. I don't regard it as a, a mechanism for actually making my way to the solution for AGI. And I'm sitting in neuroscience, and I'm po poised on the point of building some hardware that I know is not a computer, right? There is no software, there are no models. It's just brain biophysics on a chip. And I'm actually got, got a little project to uh, that's funded and it's actually currently halted, uh, halted by COVID, a project to actually uh, build the or prototype the very first devices at macroscopic scale. So I'm sitting here and there's this question about computers and uh, computationalism and so forth. And what do you say to someone who turns up and say, I'm doing AGI, I've done nothing else but try to do that for 20 years, but I'm not using a computer and here's the hardware that does it. Wait, does such a person exist? That's me. But, <laughs> wait, what, what, uh, what approach do you use to create intelligence? Okay, imagine getting brain tissue and making an inorganic version of the brain bioelectromagnetism that it actually uses to com to do all everything that a brain does in its in an ideal form imagine a 3d printer that can literally print physical semiconductor physics in 3d that literally replicates brain tissue you end up with a chip that has is a brain like ours with an eeg like ours now this is this is possible in the near future. So I, I'm every time I say I'm doing AGI, but I'm not using computers, I get the look that I'm currently getting from several faces on the screen. Right. Uh, I recognize that look, it's quite amazing. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. I'm, I, I suppose I want to just put that there and that maybe is all I need to do. Uh, pose Thanks. that as a potential thing. And if we, we can take it up another time, it's too big. Um, but I just thought I'd mention that when I say computers, I mean general purpose computers, not using them. Tons of computation in this device, no computer. Thank okay? you. And that distinction okay, so is something that's. So yeah. we're, okay, we're, done. Martin has okay. a time line now. I'm out of here. Throw me off the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. See you. Thanks yeah. for the effort, anyway. Cheers. Uh, I actually uh, uh, believe that uh, uh, general purpose computers are not, not the only kinds of computers. So it's a terminological uh, uh, difference that we have only, only here. Because, yeah, I've got uh, uh, list five of them listed here in front of me, what I would regard as a general purpose computer. So uh, one, yeah. one, the, main, main, the main alternative is neuromorphic at the moment. So. Uh, yeah, but uh, even ENIAC, uh, you know, uh, touted to be the first uh, first computer, physical com electronic computer in the world, it didn't have any software to, to talk about. It no. just had wires. I, I'm old enough to have programmed something very similar to that. <laughs> so that there was no software uh, to be loaded yeah. there. You just had to, to go with uh, and to, to rewire that thing. Unless, and there were physical bugs that were eating that. That's why the bugging yeah. the term got from that. So Lots I, of I, switches. 
and you you have to uh, you you can of, of course say well because just because there was no general purpose language or uh, anything like that on ENIAC it wasn't a computer I think it's just uh, you can use the term computer to, to refer to, to general uh, uh, purpose computers but I'm interested in mechanic uh, in computational mechanisms whether are gen the, whether they are general uh, purpose or not so from my point of view neuromorphic chips are very much in the business of computation because they uh, would yeah, satisfy se several uh, yeah. uh, several uh, features like processing information namely that only some uh, uh, degrees of freedom of the of the uh, of the chip uh, we are interested in as changing over time it was specifically built for, for the purpose of com of doing uh, so something which is specified uh, mathematically in, as a some function and so on and so on <clears throat> so i think it's it's a it's a it's a computational mechanism whether it, it, it's probably not a general purpose and that's fine because there are lots of uh, computers which are not general purpose computers and there are more uh, turing machines than a universal turing machine and we can actually count them so it's it's true even even in mathematics that there are more Turing machines than a universal Turing machine, which also comes in, in uh, a lot of flavors. So, I mean, we could discuss this for hours. It's all very fascinating. But I, I'd just like to sort of end with the possibility that that someone could turn up out of left field, me or someone in my future, because I'm too old to see this out. Um, with a solution that will then get you to uh, re you'll get your answer and then you'll be able to see whether your isms were right and the isms wouldn't be involved in the process that's that's the kind of main message this could be all be solved empirically in by neuroscience so which is where i'm actually at at the moment i'm in neuroscience thank you so, so much i'll really leave it there Alan. really appreciate it Different no worries another time add a link to your work in the chat so that everyone can see what you were talking about thank you okay sure adam we are ready for you can we hear you now adam adam is here but i but he's somehow yeah there he is still no hearing of the adam oh i don't hear do you hear him? i can't hear him no oh wait did you fix it or that's just us talking no, no, I'm, I cannot hear him. Okay. All right. Sorry. Adam. Like Who's next? Adam, keep working on it. Maybe call him from your phone. So is Guy Inflay in here? Uh, he has the next, or easily, that's the next, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, yeah. That's the next uh, high voted question. I'm going to read Adam's question maybe just because of the, at least one of them, because he's on stage at least. Why does computation uh, arrow software <laughs> or <laughs> traditional computational systems read analog circuits or direct implementations of mathematical processing? So why do you think that computation means software is that what you had in mind adam blink twice if you <laughs> okay okay that's what he meant so why does computation mean software and uh, uh the idea of analog circuits being the direct implementation of mathematical processing how about that well uh i don't think computation is software I think analog computation is fine. I love Moniac, a water-based computer that simulated economy keenest, uh, according to Keynes uh, principles. You can still that, see that in a museum in London, I believe. It had very nice pumps and so on. There is a beautiful paper uh, by Alistair Isaac about this machine. Uh, it's an analog machine, didn't have discrete symbols to work with, but it was used to simulate uh, a process uh, uh, and it actually computed certain functions. So uh, why not? Uh, we we still are in in mathematics. I don't think the jury is is still out on the question whether we could have a notion of general purpose analog computation or universal analog computation. Uh, but uh, the I. 
the the last time I checked, the the closest to the answer was Nahum Darshavis, who works with Yuri Gurevich on so-called evolving algebras or uh, uh, the abstract state machines. So he had an analog version of that. So if you're interested in that, I think that was the closest to to that. But in general, people uh, people are pessimistic about having a universal analog computation as a, as a mathematical model. But I, I don't think there is a proof it's impossible. I think another thing Adam said was uh, uh, maybe, he, he says, does intelligence need universal computation? And uh, he says that he thinks we need a better definition of what functions means. So those are his two follow-ups. Does intelligence and uh, does intelligence need universal computation? And what exactly is a function? Well, Alan Newell ha had an argument that universal computation is required exactly for intelligence. Uh, but and Zenon Polition also believed that. I actually try to disprove that claim. I believe that. Uh, Universal machines that we have are not pure, are not truly universal because they are limited in the in the amount of memory we can use on them. So they actually finite machines uh, in terms of the uh, of the memory that we we give them, but we still idealize them as universal machines. Uh, so the the link between intelligence and universal computation was so flexibility. So the ability to implement any algorithm whatsoever. I don't think we are as flexible as that. And especially if you have seen the last presidential debate in the US, I don't see the a lot of flexibility, cognitive flexibility going on in this kind of events. People seem to be quite limited in kinds of responses that they have in certain environments. So, so they are constrained a lot by uh, what's going on. So I, I'm, I don't think it requires general, uh, whether you can you call that intelligence or not, it's it's another question, but it's at least it's a, it's a cognitive feat. Uh, the second question was about the notion of function. Yep. I think you are using also Ida, uh, the notion of level in, in the chat and in, in w where you talk. Actually, these are two, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the third term that did not come up but could was the notion of symbol. All of these are systematically ambiguous and people use them to mean totally different things. So uh, uh, functionalism and even in, in functionalism in philosophy of mind has at least five versions in which they differ with how they understand function. So it's and it's only in philosophy of mind because in philosophy of social science, they understand functions to, to be a total different thing. So, and mathematical functions are, are still diff, a different thing. So one thing is, is to be a biological function, which could be understood in many ways, but it's as a kind of a teleology or functionality or goals involved in organisms or something like that. You could have a, a causal role. So something which is an abstract uh, dynamics or abstract structure or something. You could have a function as a mathematical function from certain inputs to certain outputs. And you could have a function in uh, in terms of uh, usability or affordances. So these are four main notions that we might mean. And when you go to specification of function, it, it turns out that you can be more or less precise and there are lots of versions of, 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 of uh, uh, these uh, uh, stances on function that you could have. And that creates a lot of uh, terminological discussions. And the same goes with levels. It's, 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 it's a quagmire. It's, it's a very difficult notion to define with and uh, to, to, to... So I'm, I'm trying to avoid that when talking because I don't think it's very easy. It, there are no universal levels that we understand easily as, as being the same uh, uh, between different disciplines. So I'm trying to avoid that because uh, people might misunderstand their points, uh, but it really depends on the context 
and I don't want to go into a kind of a lexicon uh, trying to, to distinguish things. So Adam asks a question from me and he says he, his issue is that uh, function representation are used differently in psych, philosophy and math. And that I agree with. I don't agree that all the philosophers are vague about it because if you name a specific paper you're talking about, they are very clear about what they mean. And I think that uh, Davidson and Fodor have been clear about them in their papers, in their specific papers that I've named. But I agree with you, Adam, that in math, especially math versus psychology versus uh, philosophy, the word function and representation mean very different things. And honestly, in reinforcement learning, even in empirical reinforcement learning, which doesn't even mean human, it means deep learning and uh, sort of uh, deep RL approaches, versus theoretical reinforcement learning, word mean different things. So it's an interesting thing that, you know, so I'm totally with you about that. But I think that if we talk about a very specific paper, a very specific philosopher, then we can see that there is some consistency there. It, we could argue whether that philosopher is consistent or not, but some papers have been very clear about the difference between lower level at physics level or chemistry level sort of uh, uh, similarities, which a lot of people in systems neuroscience like to go at that level, and a sort of a higher level notion of, let's say, pain, or let's say something like working memory, or let's say memory in general, which could be applied at many different uh, levels. Okay, Adam says, thanks. Um, Iris, are you capable of joining us on stage? You've had a lot of good points. I don't know if you're still there. Is I, uh, Iris, Iris, are you still there? Okay, is there a, so I'm just going to read, I, have you invited Iris? Uh, I'm not sure if she would like to join us, but I can read her. I invited her, Iris. Why don't you read Guy's question? Because Guy couldn't Oh join. yeah, I'll read Guy's question. Okay, he said he can't join. He has a good question. He says, are there biological systems that we can clearly say are not computers? If so, how is the brain different from these systems? Uh, I'm sorry, it didn't go through. Uh, so could you could you repeat that? Yes, of course, happy to. Um, so I'm reading Guy Easley's question. And wait, who is on stage now? Oh, hi. Okay. So, uh, and uh, he says, are there biological systems that we can clearly say are not computers? And if so, how is the brain different from these systems? Uh, I'm not a biologist, but the way I understand some, some of my friends who are in philosophy of immunology, they say that Biological individuals exist only in organisms that they have immune system. And the immune system seems a computational system to me. Uh, and this is what it does. It, 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 it does process information. So probably there cannot be a biological organism or a biological individual without, uh, without being a com out there a computer because it, it involves computation in its own very function. Of, of defending itself against uh, foreign proteins. So I don't think there are biological organisms that are not computational. But I, I'm not a biologist. I might be wrong about immune systems. I, I have very limited knowledge about immune systems. Hi, Iris. We're very happy to have you here. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. excellent. Uh, hi, Martin. Very nice to hi. see you. Uh, we met uh, years ago in Tilburg, and we are in the same uh, time uh, zone, <laughs> so I'm also half sleeping. Uh, so my question, uh, yeah, uh, actually is motivated by the original question, like, is the brain a computer? And uh, the discussions, continuing discussions, also sort of reoccurring on Twitter whenever this question comes up again, there's these uh, heated reactions. And I've been struggling with a question myself, and I hope by posing it <laughs> the, to you, uh, maybe to resolve it, or maybe other people have ideas on this too. Uh, and this is, uh, I posted here also in the chat, like, is there a difference between asking, is the brain a computer? Or can we computationally explain cognition? I already asked a question about the poll being phrased in terms of mind and not uh, brain. And for instance, if I think about my own work, I actually don't ask myself the question, is the brain a computer? 
I mostly think about can, how can I explain certain cognitive capacities? How can we explain common sense? And can we explain them computationally? And so that's maybe, maybe we can, maybe we cannot. And I actually agree uh, with you that I think common sense is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, but the question I have is, even if we can explain cognition computationally, does that then imply that the computer, uh, that the brain is a computer? That's my question. And especially if you, for instance, take more embodied view or embedded view on cognition, maybe extended cognition, I would say that doesn't go through that reasoning. So I'm very curious what you think of this. Okay. Uh... This is, this is an excellent question, but I, I hope I have an answer, actually. Uh, that's strange, because I, I was afraid you would be asking a question I had never asked myself. So the, the, uh, a lot of people would say that you, uh, you can explain things computationally without even presupposing that they're computational. You can, you can have a computational model of weather. You can have a computational model of earthquakes. Earthquakes are, if you're not a pan-computationalist who, pan who thinks that everything is a computer, you don't really think that tectonic processes are computational. Uh, so, but you could have, and there are good reasons to have computational models of earthquakes, uh, to just to try to avoid the, the, uh, the dready consequences of earthquakes. So people do build them without presupposing that they are computational. But you, you, you need to understand the dynamics of a process. And the best way to do that uh, right now is to build uh, numerical models, usually, or things like that. So you could, you could have models of this. You could also say, brain is yet another instance of that. And this is a position of John Searle on the, on the issue. You could have computational modeling. Just don't tell me this is really a computer. It's just similar to whether as similar to a brain, it's not, uh, it's not wet, it's not really weather, it's not really a brain because it doesn't have uh, all this biological stuff going on. So that's one, one way of looking at that. Uh, you, could, you could be a, a little bit more sophisticated than that and you say, I'm instrumental about my computational models. I do a lot of modeling, but I don't think they are really, really, really true. They are just useful for me to get a job, to get a postdoc, to get a grant, to, to score a, a, a really good publication, or to help my friends to get uh, new experiments. Instrumentalists have all these options. But I'm a realist. I'm a staunch uh, a scientific realist. So I, I believe me that too. if... if, if if computational models work repeatedly and replicably and reproducibly, which is very rarely the case, but if they do, if they are validated, then saying that they're just useful is saying nothing because it doesn't really explain why they are successful. The only way to explain why they are successful is that they must track something. And I, I defend the view that they actually are not only just explanations of good models of tectonics or, or uh, weather, in this case, there are just good models of things which are by themselves doing some computations. And by having this uh, uh, hypothesis, you can actually presuppose that there would be certain things going on, so that there would be inputs, outputs, that there would be some control going on. These are things that you would be actually presupposing because computers that do not do anything that is ah, control related seems to be, uh, I mean, there is no user for our brains be beyond ourselves. So the, the, it must be directly related to the control issues. So if it, if it is the case, I think the, the realist in us would say, if it's successful, then the, the presupposition is usually that it should be true to be this successful. And then uh, the difference would be, you're making this bold claim and it's stronger claim, but it's, of course, uh, by being stronger, it's easier to disprove because uh, you're making a lot of assumptions about the structure of the thing, which you are not making about weather. You're not saying that weather has inputs that you can play with and it has outputs that you can read out or it controls something. You're not making, you cannot use, uh, 
I don't know, good regulator theorem on weather. It makes no sense to me. So can I ask Iris just, Iris, just to understand, because you finally came into the room, so we want to keep you here. <laughs> um, so what did I do? Nothing. No, but I just <laughs> thank you, Marcin. But it just seems to me that if you build, like you said in your question, um, computational models of cognition, isn't it implicit, at least in some people who make computational models of cognition, that they feel like the steps that you're positing in your computational model, the brain itself is going to have to do on representations also. So isn't that implicit that you feel like you're guessing at what the brain itself is going to have to go through in terms of steps to get the behavioral outcome that you're modeling? Isn't that your goal to, to, to believe that you're finding some kind of homomorphism between what you're modeling and what you think the brain itself must be going through algorithmically? Isn't that the project? Yeah, yeah I, I understand I think, the question. Uh, can I can I comment? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I, I I understand the question, and I think my question was not clear how I phrased it, and that's maybe because I don't understand my own question very well yet. Um, so I am also a realist, and if I make a computational model, then I also implicitly assume that. If that were to accurately model cognition, then I'm also claiming that it's physically realized in some way. For many cognitive capacities, that will be the brain, but I do not exclude that some cognitive computations actually are realized in brain-body world interaction, but I would still call that computational and also real. Maybe what I'm asking, because there's often also these discussions of if the brain is just a computer, like is there nothing the brain can do that isn't also that isn't also computing? And I don't know. So, but maybe that's not what we consider here, or among maybe um, cognitive neuroscientists. But maybe there are things that the brain can do that are not computational, but they, we don't count them to our cognitive capacities. And so that actually the targets of our, the, the explananda, the things we want to explain, those are the cognitive capacities we have. Maybe they are indeed because of the computational abilities of the brain. So in that sense, the brain is also a computer, but also in these discussions, sometimes comes up, is the brain just a computer? Like is yeah. everything that the brain does, can that also yeah. be computationally explained? Maybe, the, yeah, is this a clearer question? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's yeah, a okay. very clear yeah. question. So I, I think I alluded to this kind of answer in the case of uh, consciousness. Uh, some people would say that uh, subjectivity of consciousness requires something more than computation, that the privacy of, of consciousness, if that's a real feature, uh, should be explained as something in addition to computation. So that would be one candidate. Mm -hmm. Another one is something you were mentioning. Actually, I had a, a PhD student uh, who defended his dissertation on uh, distributed cognitive systems, and uh, he has a mechanistic take on Ed Hutchins uh, idea. So he has an idea that these are computational systems operating on external representations, such as sometimes a paper map. But of course, they are not reducible to a single brain because there is no a single brain that coordinates all the activity. The whole physically uh, dispersed system, distributed system is doing the thing. So it's not reducible to a single brain dynamics. And I think in, in, uh, uh, in many uh, cases that we know of, you, we would have uh, 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 this kind of uh, necessity even go beyond a single brain when you have, I don't know, faculty meeting. Uh, so sometimes it ends up with answers which are less intelligent than individual uh, faculty members. And the way to explain that, that there's some dynamics, computational dynamics that lowers the IQ of the faculty meeting as compared to individual members uh, and things like that. So I think 
we have these kinds of dynamics, which could be also explained by referring to external representations, papers, pencils, notes, computers, artifacts, sometimes very uh, advanced artifacts in labs and so on that, that are computational because they are concerned with representations, semantic information. They, they change that information from one format to another to be easily understood by one system and, and another, but it's still but it's definitely not reducible to a single brain alone. And science definitely is not. All scientific activity is, is dispersed among a lot of people. So uh, that, that would be my, my answer uh, to this kind of question. So it's, comp it's not definitely reducible to a single brain. And it might not be just the computation. Uh, maybe there are some other features. Uh, it's difficult to. I would I would say intentionality is not reducible to uh, to computation as as such, and that requires much more than just computation. It requires a certain kind of relations with uh, relational and op an operational f uh, profile of a system. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are a lot of uh, related questions that I'm going to read very fast so that we uh, get through a lot of questions. So one person is asking, um, for instance, let me see where to even start. There's so many. Um, yeah, Patrick Watson has a question that I think is relevant here. And uh, he says, can you speak a little on collective information processing? Many cognitive processes, such as language, flow through multiple individuals. What consequences that, does that have for a computational theory of mind? And he amends to that that uh, also Iris has reminded me that many computations run through the environment as well. I'm generally interested in the panel's discussion on what the scope of the brain is. Does the computational explanation allow us to distinguish individuals from each other? And uh, I want to also mention that uh, Martian's paper that we uh, referenced in the Twitter discussion does discuss uh, this to some extent. And I think that his argument there, and he will explain it better right now, that it's computation and then some uh, is kind of uh, great. And uh, once he answers this, there's a relevant question, then I will also read that one. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh it, it's been some something like a tradition in uh, uh, in computational explanations that stemming from Jerry Fodor, of course, uh, to be a methodological individualist or even solipsist, and to to understand that computation happens inside the skull, and that's it. Uh, but that's a very outdated view, I believe. And uh, if you're doing things which are not about this. Uh, which are about biological uh, neural systems, but not necessarily the central nervous system, you might be surprised that it's not in the head and you're still doing computation neuroscience. So I think it's totally outdated to think about the contents of a skull, even if you're talking about biological organism. I mentioned immune systems, for example, but you might also think about uh, the gut. You might also think about other things like that. Uh, so individualism was wrong for many reasons. One of them is to, to presuppose that the, the brain is the only thing worthy of attention. The second thing is that there are lots of things in cognition that require going beyond the single individual. And that also is not, it is, uh, I think uh, it's been, you, you could have two strategies on that. The first strategy is to grow big, expand, to have a larger computational system. This is what Edwin Hutchins does. So expand your system, eat everything inside the system. So have all the, so have almost the whole faculty as a, as a single computer that processes information. That's one option you could have. So the whole community that speaks one language would be as uh, one cognitive system or one linguistic system or whatever, but it grows big. Another uh, way, which is somewhat related to what Fodor was doing, is to grow go small. 
grow smaller than you think. And I think this is this is what Herb Simon was doing. He thought memory is not the part of the system. It's, it's the environment. The, cognitive, the computational system does not contain the memory. It's the inner environment and the outer environment that change between the explanations, that change between behaviors. And it, of course, it changes over time because uh, people learn. Uh, learning history is important, but it's the explanation. The explanations would have to describe the environment rather than the structure of the agent, which remains roughly the same. Uh, the uh, the this, this strategy unfortunately uh, presupposes uh, that the system does not reconfigure. It's not plastic. It's, it's not really realistic, but it tries to say that there is something invariant and very small and very simplistic that we can model. So I think in computational explanation, in uh, you have these those two traditions: grow big, embrace everything, and then it becomes bigger and bigger and di more difficult to uh, to say how how big sh should that be. Uh, you you have to stop at some point, and that the uh, the, the way to do it, I believe, is be specific what you're trying to explain, what it involves, because language is not actually a, a, any phenomenon that you explain it's it's a term it, but if you're ex, if you're trying to actually explain some specific thing like how children learn their language maybe excluding including the whole society is not really relevant to the explanation so that's one thing and the another tradition is to grow small try to be as simple as possible and try to exclude everything but you know, as a philosopher of science, I would say there are certain uh, advantages to, to both. One, the, pers the parsimonious models are nicer to work with, but they might be pretty. Uh, uh, they they are supposed to be invariant and 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 unchangeable, but that's exactly the problem that invariancy, the the unchangeability of those small systems might be difficult to uh, adapt to what's going on in the real world but the the larger systems are difficult to to uh, to model and if you're looking at for example brain be and behavioral uh, uh, sciences the journal you would see that there are lots of papers right now there talking about culture and what i miss in these papers is modeling they're just papers that talk about things you know affordances regime of attention i don't know uh, influences of, of of culture on on music uh, uh, perception, but there are no models because these models are extremely difficult to build because we don't know how to do that, or at least these people who are probably the best ones in behavioral sciences because BBS is one of the best journals. There is something wrong about that, so uh, I think this is this is the problem. It's difficult to build such big models uh, uh, to be. Uh, for them to be precise, but I think we should be doing that. Sorry, so I just want to say, from from the perspective of someone who does build models of collective memory and does run experiment, behavioral experiments on them too, and yeah, you know, I've published work in it and I keep doing it, and I've seen a lot of people who are doing work on maybe somebody's echoing. Okay, so. Okay, now the echo is gone. Thank you so much. Um, so from that perspective, I disagree that it's very hard to model. In fact, it, I've seen beautiful models at the levels of, you know, whether it's collective memory, whether it's sort of, uh, uh, I even studied how the specific graph structure of conversations among peoples determines whether their memories converge and to what extent, and can we predict exactly which concepts they were talking about become central. So I would say that there is not only my models, there's so many other people using even theoretical RL to do it for a while now too. We even have from 10 years ago work using RL on uh, uh, basically homeostasis of creatures and how they can, uh, creatures would seek different kinds of approaches to minimize their sort of uh, uh, needs. Uh, so I, I think that maybe it's, uh, too late to say these are too complicated or there are no models because the past 30 years has seen a lot of it. 
And also for collective behavior, we even had a Nobel Prize winner in the 70s uh, with the book um, Micro Motives and Macro Behavior, uh, Thomas Schelling. And uh, he was the initiator of a huge set of mathematical models of micro macro interaction of behavior and collective level. So I and, and fi showing how you get, you know, collective level effects based on individual sort of simple principles. So I would say uh, that was a great question, Patrick. And I think maybe philosophy should do a little bit more of updating the notions of functionalism to collective uh, notions of computation or function as well. Uh, but uh, John has something to say. So I just wanted to say, I mean, if I understood also what Iris said about not everything about the brain should be computational, it doesn't necessarily mean, Marcin, that you have to go out into the world to other individuals in the environment. It's just, wouldn't it be interesting if there were non-computational properties of the brain plus the computational properties of the brain, which together could be put into an external computational model? So in other words, the computational model can cover the non-computational components and the computational components of the brain. You can do a computational component of a rock, a computational model of a rock, right? So in other words, I think, unless I'm paraphrasing Iris wrongly, is maybe you can sum up the non-computational and computational components of the brain without not going out into the environment and still have a computational model of the two together, right? So you don't have to go out into the world to say that the brain might be doing something in addition. Maybe the glia are doing something, the blood vessels, maybe the mass of a ball of neurons. Do you see? Could still be some computational function though. We don't, we, it's not necessary that because it's glia or if it's the mass that's doing something that at a function, at, that at a functional level, it can Yeah, but, but you wouldn't say that a rock is computing anything. Right. right. So we don't need pan computationalism in the sense of rock is computing something to say that uh, glia might have a function that is computationally capturable. I yes. think that Iris' think point was that, yeah, I think this was Iris' point from the yeah. beginning. It was clear to me and to Brad also in the chat from the beginning. Uh, though, do we need to even say that the brain is a computer if all that we are saying is that important functions of the brain, of cognition, can be captured with computational models. If I'm, thank you, Iris, do you want to comment on that? That's how I understood you. Well, you said it clear. So, so I guess that maybe you did that as like, is it necessary, this question is sort of like, with the big I, is the brain a computer? I don't know how scientifically helpful it is. And I think it's more helpful to think like, what, what do we want to explain? And do we think that computation, as we understand it, or other people may understand it differently, is that sufficient to explain what we want to explain, or do we need something else? Yeah, that, thank you. Yeah, that's how I understood your question. I didn't feel like that particular question had an answer. Oh yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I ask you a question about models of the environment? So I'm not sure if I completely understood, uh, but um, so I, this is, comes from my own work uh, on computational uh, tractability. And one of the main theses that I put forth is actually to understand how cognition can be tractable. I think we cannot explain this. Uh, maybe I'll come back to uh, uh, argue why. Uh, uh, explain this solely, solely by appealing to capabilities of the brain. So for this, I think we must assume that the world or the environment we interact with must be structured in such a way that we act, that our cognition uh, can be tractable that if if we would have to deal with any possible world it wouldn't be um, so we need to have some friendly world in a sense and for this i think it's important to model also the environment in our computational models of cognition and i was wondering if the models that you mentioned of the environment if those are the models computational models from the perspective of the scientist, so that the scientist trying to cover uh, regularities and, and principles and computationally explain, uh, you gave this example, I don't want to know, social interactions, or is it a model of the environment as used by the agent in order to uh, yeah, make yeah, cognitive efficacy possible? 
And I think these are two different perspectives. And I don't necessarily think models of the, the kind of the scientist perspective kind serve that kind of explanatory role. Is that a question to Martin? Um, it's a comment to everybody, but also a question to, to you, uh, Ida, if the kinds of models you mentioned were the of one of these types or both? Great question. So the collective memory models, it's the structure, uh, the experimenter designs the structure of the participant. The participant doesn't know the structure of the people they're having a conversation with. So it is the structure of the bigger group of people who are talking to each other, the graph structure of it that's determining the outcome without any of the participants subjectively or in their mind knowing that this is the reason or that this actually, they don't even know what is the structure that is going on. All of them just see three chat windows popping up. They don't know what is the bigger structure of these chat windows. And as to your other question, the reinforcement learning framework goes at huge lengths to just model the particular environments and the statistics of the environment are extremely important. And theoretical reinforcement learning, for instance, goes at lengths to just show provable uh, sort of uh, evidence that a particular algorithm or a particular approach can adequately capture the statistics of the environment, like you know, contextual bandits and everything else that goes on there. And if you go back to um, more like even uh, deep reinforcement learning approaches, uh, the entire sort of environments created like Majoku uh, or the sort of the common sense environment that was created by DeepMind where, you know, you, 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 you sort of have a surface like this and you push it. And if it stays here, instead of completely falling, the agent should be surprised. So just learning about this intuitive physics that Kim was mentioning earlier as well. So as Kim was mentioning earlier, a lot of uh, us uh, uh, with different approaches, including the Tenenbaum lab that uses more probabilistic models or the DeepMind folks and um, sort of Matt Botvinnik's group or the people in theoretical RL at uh, Microsoft Research and John Langford, all of these different groups, they definitely take the statistics of the environment as one of the most uh, sort of uh, important aspects. And uh, Katya Hoffman actually even designs mine, uh, Minecraft-based 3D worlds where you can train your agents. And there are sort of, for instance, uh, sort of competitions about which agent can actually manage to mine diamond or something else, which entirely is contingent on the statistics of these environments. And AI gym is another place where you get a lot of environments and your agent needs to have the cognitive capacities, for instance, for hierarchical reasonings or such to solve different kinds of problems in these environments. So I would say that the computational world is super aware of it and the even collective memory or collective computation or I wouldn't want to say collective computation. The collective cognition sort of uh, world also cares about uh, a lot about this, these structures. This is the micro macro interactions, which um, yeah. Journal, there's a journal coming out, um, I think it's called Collective Intelligence, that Jessica Flack has launched from the Santa Fe Institute. And I think she's very much also at the forefront of agreeing with both of you that you have to bring in the environment and other agents. Um, it's quite exciting. I don't know, if it's, it's being launched soon, I think. I'm actually, look, we are, this is incredible. We're getting to 6.15 almost, right? Um, so this is another record um, session. I, I um, actually have to go. I'm sure Ida and Josh can continue to host. Um, Marcin, honestly, thank you so much for having your Wonder Woman bracelets off to fight off all these questions that have been coming in at high speed for the last hour and a half. Um, Iris, thank you very much for coming into the room, and I hope we can persuade you to actually be a guest for the whole show very, very soon, right? Um, it was a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it would be nice to be back again. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, is Ida, Josh, will you forgive me if I, uh, if I go? Will I, am I allowed? Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Marcin, very much. Ciao. Nice. Bye. Bye. So I guess we can actually slowly uh, wrap up potentially. Uh, so I just want to thank Marcin and I want to thank uh, Iris. I want to thank Kim. I want to thank Adam. I, I want to thank everybody who was on stage and asked their question. And uh, yeah, uh, if you would like to say some final words, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to follow up 
uh, what I was saying, thank everybody and continue to encourage people, especially new people who've never spoken up on our salon or maybe never spoken up on any salon. Uh, please feel free. We really appreciate and value different perspectives from different backgrounds. Um, there, there's no question that I think that we won't address um, to the best of our abilities and, and we'll be grateful for hearing your perspective. Yeah, and I, just a, another reminder, uh, the deadline for biological and artificial RL, it's a workshop at NeurIPS, I'm chairing it, and uh, some of the attendants of the salon are organizing it together with me. The deadline is on the 7th. Uh, go to my Twitter if you would like to sort of uh, uh, send your, submit your paper. We would be very happy to receive your papers at the intersection of human, uh, biological, and machine learning. And I also want to thank Worldwide Neuro for uh, helping get the word out and supporting us. It's been a really great organization to be working with. Um, and encourage everyone to get engaged with them and find out about lots of other cool things they're doing. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's past midnight in Poland, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit passing out. But uh, uh, is this uh, uh, chat feed available somewhere uh, to be browsed afterwards? Because there were some excellent questions. I, I, I couldn't at this hour actually read them when, when speaking, so I, I would really love to read them. So I think the entire chat might not be available after this. This whole session will be available on the same length, but um, uh, Claire has been, Claire Sun has been uh, wonderfully taking notes of everything that happened in the chat. So I think that uh, she could potentially be in touch with you. Um, Thanks again. I want to thank everybody in the chat who participated. Thank you, Brad and Kanaka, Eva and uh, Claire. And uh, we hope to send you, Martin, soon the uh, copy to the chat. But you can, of course, scroll up as much as is available and see the Ask a Question. Um, just so everybody knows, in the poll we had, is the mind a computer? 56.8% said yes. 29.5% said no. 13.6% said maybe. But when we rephrase the question and ask, does the mind rely on representations and computations? Then 75% said yes, only 9% said no, and 15.9% said maybe. So I guess how we frame the question also seems to have a different impact on what people think. I totally forgot I had brain in my title. I just <laughs> took a paper that had that was slightly written and had, and was somewhat relevant to AI and in neuroscience, and I thought it would be easy to read. But I was stunned with questions, and I looked at the title, oh my god. <laughs> we, I really personally enjoyed your paper, for the record. I think that that was a very clearly written paper. And I want to thank you again for being here at midnight. Uh, we know that it's very late for you and we really appreciate you and this this uh, salon is always a little intense and we really appreciate that you were here at this hour with us. Thank you and uh, for myself I'd say good night. Good night. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you for joining us. Please Bye join everyone. Us. Thank you.